have you had a chance to meet Amir Muhammad, Harry Billups, and talk to him? And, and what was that like? Yeah, I've had a number of conversations with him. Um, the latest, I think, was just a few days ago, actually. And, uh, you know, he's living out in Georgia and um, just living his life and taking care of his family and trying to avoid all this. And I think he thought it was all behind him until this most recent book came out by Randall Sullivan, uh, just resurrecting all of these old claims. And uh, so I did the same thing with him that I have did with Reg. I said, you need to get out there and defend yourself, man. Publicly defend yourself. Because when people see you and hear you, they're going to have a completely different impression than what they have by what they've been told in these books. You sit down. He's a very intelligent guy, very articulate, very kind and respectful. He's educated. You know, there's nothing about him at all that resonates like, wow, that sounds like, you know, somebody who would have done this. It's not that impression that you get. And then, of course, we know factually, just because of all the evidence that was proposed to stand up against him, was all, you know, disproven. But uh, I, I think that for him, his decision is just to stay, stay in the cut and not, not come out and do anything about it. So Now, James, what do you think about that? Because Reggie Wright decided, because Reggie Wright was quiet for many, many years. No one had heard from him. And he decided to come out, defend himself. But for whatever reason, Harry Billups hasn't publicly said a word. Am I right on that? He's never publicly said a word. No, the only thing he's ever done in his own defense is he went to a deposition. He was summoned to a deposition as a result of the Wallace lawsuit. He went to the deposition, and almost immediately after that deposition, he was dropped from the lawsuit. What do you think about that, James? Uh, two different approaches. Reggie decides to defend himself. Harry Billups, Amir Muhammad decides it, not it, to. It really all depends on the person. He, he just don't want to deal with it. Um, Reggie was like that at first, too. But then when... When you told Reggie he needed to get out there and defend himself, Reggie took it. Reggie is smashing everybody that got something to say to him. <laughs> yeah. So Reggie found a way to deal with it, and that's his way. You know, getting that and proving to, to everybody that this person is whoop de whoop whoop. You, you ain't good enough to talk about me like that. So I advise people not to talk about Reggie. But this guy, Why? Why go out there and start talking and then somebody take the smallest thing and make it out of something real big and then now he's really in the loop. Oh, you heard he said this? He's doing the right thing. Live your life. Don't worry about what nobody else got to say about you and just do you. Stay away from all this. It's just unfortunate that you have people out here trying to eat off something that would, that happened 23 years ago and, it, and it, they don't realize that it's still affecting People that's still alive today, you know, is hurting them. So, and they don't take into consideration that it's not just him. He's got a wife. He's got kids. He's got neighbors. He's got coworkers, and people talk. Exactly. And they'll form opinions off of what they've been told, and that's where I, again, that's where I take issue with these guys. That factually, um, he's completely innocent. He's so exonerated that. Uh, the fact that these people are still pursuing and advocating for that bullshit story, it's so irresponsible and disrespectful. So is this, I haven't had a chance to look at Randall's new book, but um, I'm sure you've read everything. Mm -hmm. Is he repeating some of the same stuff in the Labyrinth book, in the new book as well? Yeah, it's kind of like the sequel. It's just the same narrative, same storyline, but the conspiracy has grown massively. <laughs> now it's just not a dirty cop and and uh, in his high school or his uh, college buddy. Um, now it's a dirty cop, his college buddy, the United States Attorney's Office, the FBI, the LAPD, the district attorneys, all these. Now it's there's 200 people involved in this conspiracy who are all agreeing to risk their reputations, their careers, and their lives to cover up for David Mack. And this is not a novel. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like a novel the way it, you describe it. it. It's, it's, it's ludicrous. You know, the, the idea that all of these people, who most of who don't even know each other, from all of these different walks of life and all these different agencies, are all going to collectively agree that we need to... We need to suppress all this information in order to protect David Mack and Amir Mohammed. Now, last, um, at that Slow Burn event, it seemed like you guys must have a history. It wasn't just that one night you guys no, went no, at no. it. 
can you t- explain uh, the history that you and Mr. Sullivan have to where it seems like as soon as you guys are on the same stage, you're going at it. W- where, what's the history like between you guys? We're not, I, this isn't friendly. I mean, I, I, he has disrespected and abused the memory of my friend Russell Poole. I have disrespected Russell Poole. You have, Poole. certainly. We can't hear you, Greg. I have done nothing other than say that I thought that Russ lost his objectivity. I said that I knew that in the end, okay, there, okay. there is no way, hold on a second, there is no way that I have maligned him more than you did in your own book by describing his life. I mentioned his professional career and what I thought he did objectively wrong. Russ, Russell's family loves me. They love everything I've written about him. I don't think they feel Of course they don't because I oppose his theory. Okay, but, well, let's, I don't want to, I don't want to, if, if we're going to talk about the differences, then I'd say that I personally know him because I never have. There's no personal history. I've never met him before. I've never talked to him before. In fact, that was one of my points last night on the stage. I was like, you know, you're publishing all of this. You have information. And you should, if you're a responsible journalist and you really want to find out the truth, you need to get as many different perspectives on things as you can. If somebody's accused of something, you need to go talk to that person and get their side of the story, right? And, you know, he makes these wild accusations against me. He never made any attempt whatsoever to come and talk to me to say, hey, Greg, well, this is what I heard. I'm going to write a book. You have an opportunity here to either correct this or provide at least your perspective on it. That's what you do when you're looking for the truth. That's what you do when you want to publish something with a responsible, objective perspective. It's not what they do. What they want to do is continue with this bullshit narrative that's completely disproven in in the hopes that they can continue to um, mislead people into believing this wild-ass theory about this huge cover-up. The very first thing I did when I got assigned to this um, investigation was I read the book Labyrinth. And I found it to be very compelling. I thought, wow, this is, if this is true, this is really interesting stuff. And so we began to build an investigative strategy where we were going to take all the competing theories, the Southside Crips, the Shug Knight and the Mob Piru, um, um, Russell Poole with the Dirty Cop. Uh, we just looked at everything practical. We weren't doing the ones that were way off, like Tupac, or I'm sorry, with uh, uh, certain people like... Um, Clues came in from everywhere, let me tell you, we were just overwhelmed. We took the things that were the most plausible and began to work with them. The first one we really dove into was Russell Poole's. And we began to look at the foundation of his claims. And faster than we expected, we were able to determine that the foundation fell apart. And everything that was built on that foundation necessarily had to fall with it. And so when we began to investigate those claims, uh, in a matter of months, we knew that Russell Poole's theory could not hold mustard, that we could not use his theory as a, uh, a viable um, proposition for the, for the crime. And, and that's what so often happens in these type of either debates or you know, these, these arguments, is that when they can't disprove your facts, then they just personally attack you. And that seems to be the approach that they take. Well, we can't disprove the facts, so now we have to smear his reputation. Like that one part where he was talking about Miss Wallace and the 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 tape was supposed to be hidden or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, when she seen that, she got mad. And a lot of people don't know that, but people think that the purpose of of talking to her and dealing with her or you coming in is to discredit that so they can drop the lawsuit. Mm. And once the lawsuit was dropped, now here come all the shenanigans again. But but when she didn't know that that about the hidden tape, explain that how that went last night. Yeah. So during the trial, there was a there was a allegation that the LAPD was suppressing some evidence. Which trial can you explain? The, the wall. The uh, biggest the. After Biggie was killed and the book Labyrinth was published, uh, based on the information in the book, it compelled an attorney to contact Mrs. Wallace and say, look, if, if these claims are true, then the LAPD is culpable in the murder of your son. We ought to sue him. That led to a lawsuit in 2002, roughly. And so that lawsuit, as it began to go through the motions of court, um, got to a point where their attorneys argued that we were suppressing evidence. So they came to the police department, 
uh, on the judge's orders, and they found some material that was in the um, the desk of the investigator that was assigned to the case at the time, a guy named Stephen Katz. And they found a tape from a jailhouse informant named Kenneth Boagney. So they made this big deal about it. Look, it, man, here's proof. They're suppressing evidence. Look, this detective interviewed a guy, and this guy says that uh, Rafael Perez was involved in this murder. And you're familiar with Rafael Perez, the Rampart scandal guy. And so that went you know, to court, and the judge was like, hell yeah, this is clearly... Um, inappropriate suppression of evidence. So she issued a sanction against the city for like a million dollars and declared a mistrial. Well, shortly thereafter, the attorneys for the city came in and said, well, hold a minute. Here's the evidence that this stuff had been turned over. We weren't hiding anything. And all this material was readily available. It was distributed through different channels in the LAPD. And the judge then said, well, you know, she realized that she'd been played. And, uh, but the damage was done, the mistrial was declared, and now it was a matter of putting everything back in motion. So that's what took place. Um, but uh, to my point, like last night, you've got him saying, well, you know, this, this really rare ammo out there that Biggie was killed with, it's never been seen before, yeah. it's so unique, which is all bullshit. There was stores all over the South County that, that had that ammunition available to anybody that walked in and wanted to buy it. And then I pulled out the document showing that, look, just within a few months of Biggie's murder, that ammunition was showing up on other crime scenes. So really, how rare is that? But you uh, referred to the fact that Biggie had been killed by some relatively rare German ammunition. And look, you get that's in your book. Okay. Uh, actually, that ammunition, it's called gecko ammunition, it's a German bullet. It's only ever been used in one crime in the history of the United States for any of the great, which is up to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, well, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about since. Okay. Yeah, I'm not talking about up to that time. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Greg, I have that from Phil Carson, who's the FBI's lead investigator. If you ever say, Greg, do you think this is true? You've written in your well, book. Well, just a second. You're gonna let me finish. Uh, are, are you, we're, no, we're, please let's move off of that because I think that like what people want to know is like what you guys think. Well, well this, what, we're not gonna argue over the rules. So just a second. Greg, what, what Greg left out? Greg left out is that ammunition, that incredibly rare ammunition, an entire case of boxes of it were found in the garage of David Mack. You left that out of your book. Because which, it never happened. Was, it did happen. The FBI kept to I have their property report. Why yeah. would it be listed <laughs> well, on You that? know what? Then Phil Carson's a liar and fraud. Well, then you should be a Phil Carson. Phil Carson. Phil Carson. Why so I feel like this, this is something that can actually that's be resolved. Actually, that's I mean, in the other I have not been able to respond to something. Okay, well, I think I have not been able to respond to Let's move on because people want to learn. Gecko ammunition, rare ammunition, the E that Biggie Smalls was in fact killed with this ammunition that they then began to tout as rare ammunition. The reason they said that is because it's only distributed in two places in the United States. It's imported from Germany. They have a wholesale warehouse in uh, New Jersey, and there's a whole well, wholesale warehouse in Corona, California. Two places. Wholesale. It's sold all over Southern California. There was 14 different gun stores that sold this ammunition. After Tupac Shakur was killed in Las Vegas, and there was raids done at the Southside Crips house because they believed that they were involved in Tupac's murder, Gecko ammunition was being found in the houses of those Southside Crip gang members. This is before Biggie's killed. Here's a report right here, an analyzed evidence report from 4297. Wilshire Division, same division that Biggie Smalls was killed in. Three weeks after, gecko ammunition is used in another crime. Does that, that was their claim, that it's never been used in the history of the United States in any type of crime. Now, was the gun that was used to kill Pac ever recovered? Because on that A&E documentary, the one uh, Who Killed Tupac, hosted by uh, Benjamin Crump, mm -hmm. the civil rights attorney, they claim to have found the gun in the backyard of a Southside Compton Crips house. Yeah, so it was never conclusively proven to be the gun. There was good reason to believe it could have been because there was issues with Corey Edwards. He was the individual who uh, was out in Las Vegas with the rest of the Southside Crips when Pac was shot. And Corey Edwards was really, he wasn't down with all that. He wasn't trying to be part of that. And uh, so they thought he was kind of ranking out. And so when the murder went down and Corey had kind of distanced himself from it, they saw, they saw that he was just maybe too soft or whatever. 
and uh, the gun may have been tossed in his backyard just to kind of f*** with him. <laughs> that was the working theory. I don't know if that's true or not, but a forty caliber Glock was found in the backyard of uh, his girlfriend's parents' house, actually, in Compton. And uh, we recovered the gun, and uh, actually Compton had recovered the gun. We took it to Las Vegas to test it and compare it against the ballistics in Tupac's case. But the uh, analysts out in Las Vegas said that it wasn't a match. So we, yeah. had to, we had to accept that. Had to accept it, even though there's been rumors that the Las Vegas district attorney's office doesn't even want to touch this case. Yeah, you know, I again, I have to just stick with what we're being told. I can't make that. I can't draw that conclusion that they're intentionally because um, they have nothing to gain to even charge anyone in this. Because everyone would have to be dragged back to Vegas. Mm -hmm. The trial would take place there, and this is just a city that doesn't want that type of attention. Yeah, and at this point in time, there's really nobody to drag back, you know, other than Keefe D and his own confessions of his involvement. The other guys in the car are all dead. Um, the guy who gave the gun to Keefe D, he's dead. Von Zip. Von Zip, yeah. So all of these guys that would potentially be their co-conspirators or co-defendants, they're all gone. And there's no real witnesses who can come and say, yeah, I, I was there. Keefe D was the one who was in the car and had the gun and was participating in the murder. So... You've basically got Keefe D testifying against Keefe D. <laughs> Hard case to, to take to court.